Hello and welcome to the program. I'm your host, Neil Howard. Thank you for joining us here on Health Professional Radio. Our guest today is Dr. Ann O'Donnell, Division Chief of Pulmonary Medicine, Critical Care and Sleep Medicine, also Medical Director of the Sleep Disorder Center at Georgetown University. And she's here today to talk with us about NCFB, Treatments and Symptoms. Welcome to Health Professional Radio, Dr. O'Donnell. Thank you. What exactly is NCFB? It is a mouthful. Um, (laughs) It's non-cystic fibrosis bronchiectasis, and I think we could just call it bronchiectasis going okay. forward. Um, mm-hmm. It's a it's kind of a, a, a spectrum of disease mm-hmm. uh, where there's a, a abnormality in the lungs, which we characterize as bronchiectasis, meaning scar tissue that the bronchial tubes are abnormally enlarged and kind of harbor excessive mucus, and then there's a vicious cycle where there's inflammation followed by infection followed by more inflammation. So the the disease itself is really an anatomic abnormality uh, of the small airways in the lungs, and then infections can um, result in those airways or complicate that uh, anatomic abnormality. So an anatomic abnormality. So this is, is it's not caused by something, say, smoking or inhaling some type of uh, uh, irritant. It can just be caused simply due to your genes. Yes, yes. There, there's a number of causes of bronchiectasis. And mm-hmm. in general, it's it's not really a smoking-related disease, although um, occasionally it can be related to smoking. So it's not the same thing as COPD or okay. emphysema. Um, there are a number of, of sort of congenital abnormalities that people are born with that cause bronchiectasis, um, and cystic fibrosis is one. Um, But there's a a few other disorders like uh, ciliary, uh, abnormal cilia that can do it. Um, Also, things that patients acquire like immune deficiencies uh, can cause bronchiectasis. But most of the time, it's either because of a bad infection in the lungs in the past, or uh, we actually don't identify a specific cause uh, for the bronchiectasis, and then we call that idiopathic bronchiectasis. So you mentioned uh, this vicious cycle of uh, inflammation, infection, and then inflammation again. What are some of the treatments prior to these flare-ups? Yes, so um, we often really try to identify what bacteria might have um, complicated the bronchiectasis, and so then we um, can target that, um, particularly when the patient is have a flare-up of their uh, symptoms. But prior to, um, you know, having to deal with an antibiotic, we like to uh, recommend what we call airway clearance, which is just basically trying to clear out the mucus from the airways, either by exercising or by doing some uh, physical techniques that help uh, move the mucus out of the, the small bronchial tubes. So that's kind of the underpinning of our treatment even before we get into more complicated things. What are the numbers as far as people that are affected by NCFB? Yeah, probably in the United States it's about at least 100,000 patients. So it's a relatively rare disease, but it's something that we actually are recognizing more and it's being diagnosed more frequently, probably because the disease is actually increasing in frequency, but also our ability to diagnose it has gotten better uh, over the past few years. Well, you mentioned that it's not like uh, COPD. Is it misdiagnosed uh, often, even though it's rare? Is it misdiagnosed uh, quite a bit, or is that something that's a rarity? Yes. No, it it often is confused initially with COPD or even asthma. Mm -hmm. Um, And really the way we pin down the diagnosis is, first of all, to kind of elicit the symptoms from the patient. Um, Patients usually complain that they have kind of an unrelenting cough, and they often produce sputum, mucus, um, and they have frequent infections. Um, But we we actually confirm the diagnosis by doing a CT scan of of the chest, uh, and it's actually very easy to diagnose with with that scan. We also sometimes uh, prescribe some sort of device uh, a little apparatus to which patient to which patients can breathe, and it helps them to cough and move their mucus out of their lungs. And sometimes we also prescribe a, a salt water inhalation 
um, again, to help break up the mucus and, and move it out. Uh, when the patients are more symptomatic and more likely to have a flare-up, um, then we get into some sort of chronic antibiotic for, for those patients. What about um, over-the-counter expectorants for milder symptoms? Yeah, there there is a role, although it's not that well scientifically proven, to for many patients to use a, a over-the-counter medication like guaifenesin, which again is something that helps uh, thin the mucus and make it easier to cough. So that that can be helpful for patients uh, in the over-the-counter range. And some some patients have other like allergies associated with this and. Those patients sometimes benefit from taking an antihistamine, an over-the-counter antihistamine. Now, this isn't something that can be passed on from person to person, is it? No, I mean, it can be passed on because the uh, family members may have a genetic predisposition to it, and hence the genetic pass down. But no, it's not contagious. It's it's not something that uh, one one person can give to another in, in that sense. It's not contagious at all. Now these uh, abnormalities in the uh, in the bronchial tubes that you talked about, is this something that is present uh, in your early life and then manifests with problems later on, or is this something that can strike at any age? Yes, so both both scenarios uh, happen. Um, some some patients are literally born with this disease, or at least born with the predilection to develop this disease, and and those are people young, you know, infants and children who have some sort of genetic uh, predisposition to it or mm-hmm. have uh, something wrong with their immune system. But otherwise, it can really happen at any age. Uh, we tend to see it more in older patients, particularly also women more than men, mm-hmm. uh, but it can happen at, at any age um, pretty much across the spectrum of age. Now, when it comes to preventing uh, these flare-ups, now you, you mentioned uh, the, the clearing, the tube clearing, the simple walking, exercising, and sometimes uh, a device. How often is a simple uh, changing an, an environment something that offers a, a great deal of relief? In terms of changing the patient's yeah. environment? Yes. Um, maybe they're staying Yeah, in it's a, not a usually an environmental okay. disease at all. Um, I mean, some patients definitely feel worse uh, at extremes of heat and cold in terms of climate. Um, We know that um, some of the infections that complicate bronchiectasis are more common in areas of the world that are more humid. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, you know, trying to avoid excessively humid environments might help. But in general, it's, it's not really an environmentally related disease. Does there seem to be one infection in particular that seems to strike most often among infections associated with this uh, disorder? Yeah, no, that's a great question, and and it's it sort of points out the fact that we need to, in each individual patient, look to see what bacteria may be infecting them. So it's it's real important that we do a culture of their mucus or their sputum, but. Um, the, across the board, the most common bacteria is one called Haemophilus, um, which is a, a common respiratory bacteria. But there are other um, bacteria that might infect these airways, and like uh, another common, relatively common one is something called Pseudomonas, uh, and that demands a particular type of antibiotic in order to treat it. Where can our listeners go and get more information? Some good uh, websites. Uh, the National Institutes of Health has a patient-facing uh, website that really gives some good information about uh, this disease and some pictorial uh, pictures that help people understand about this disease. And and there's some other uh, groups, the Mayo Clinic, National Jewish Health have websites um, uh, that help to explain this disease to, to the patient. Uh, sort of patient-facing uh, websites like that. Well, I thank you for talking with us today, Dr. O'Donnell. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. You've been listening to Health Professional Radio. I'm your host, Neil Howard, with Dr. Ann O'Donnell, talking about NCFB. Transcripts and audio of this program are available at healthprofessionalradio.com.au and also at hpr.fm, and you can subscribe to this podcast on iTunes and listen in on SoundCloud.